What we're going to talk about today is, is a dream to learn more about each other and more about the animals that we've been granted dominion over. I think it's so important and so exciting to see some young faces here because uh, I think that why that's so important is I spent the first 35 years of my veterinary career on the wrong end of cattle. And we got a lot of work done, but at the end of the day, I was hoarse. My family had gone to the house, and I, I got a lot of stuff done, but I didn't feel very good about myself. And the last, uh, I've not been at this very long. I'm not an expert. Please, these, these, are, the, um, these are the experts. My, my life was changed when Bud Williams moved to Binkelman and lived with us for five years. My life was changed when Chris and Miranda come from Queensland, Australia and spent a summer. My life was changed when Shane Morrissey came and showed me the relationship between horsemanship and stockmanship. So I just want to share some of these things with you in the next 50 minutes. Please, there are people in this room better at doing this than I am. But I'm going to get better. For those of you that have these skills and you're already magic with a cow, a dog, or a horse, please, please never take those skills for granted. And I just want to illustrate to you when to apply these skills. If you have something on your ranch, something on your farm, something on your feedlot that has made a difference that you need to, you think is a big deal, please stand up and, and wave your hand and share it with the rest of us. The only way we get to keep what we know, the only way we get to keep what we have is to give most of it away. So please, always, always volunteer some ideas, especially if you see me doing something out of bounds. So we're going to start by just acknowledging these people that have helped me. The one that I want you to focus on, uh, Bud said, uh, I, I said, where, where are you going today? And I said, I'm going to go work cattle. Well, he said, why don't you teach the cattle to work for you? And that was new to me. Chris and Miranda came from Australia, and I said, Chris, what are you doing here? He said, Dr. Tom, I think Miranda and I found out something in the cow-calf world that will change America. But, and we know the people in Australia and feed yards need help, but we don't know anything about a feedlot. If you will help us learn about feedlots, we'd like to share what Chris and Miranda and I've learned in our cow-calf operation. They have uh, 1,600 mother cows in Queensland and 7,000 feral yearlings. And uh, not a very big crew. The Chris and Miranda and two blonde-headed little girls and about 20 Kelpie dogs take care of these creatures. And I said, Chris, what have you learned? And he, he said to me, Dr. Tom, you have cows. Uh, how much do your calves gain on weaning day? How much weight do your calves gain the, the day you separate them from their mothers? And I said, gain, Chris, they don't eat meat. How would they gain weight? I said, I have backgrounding yards that it takes them three weeks to get the purchase price back, the purchase weight back. And he said, how do people stay in business? Well, I said, it's difficult sometimes. I said, Chris, how much do your calves gain the day you wean them? And he said, I think that Miranda and I have figured out a way that if our little calves are in good grass or gaining a kilogram a day before we wean them, they will gain that same kilogram the day we separate them from their mothers. And I want to show you how to do that. I want to talk about that uh, as we go through the next 50 minutes. It's really, really important. I get to travel a little bit, and I want to tell you that this place that we live in is miraculous. There are, I've been to other parts of the world and they don't treat each other and they don't treat their animals like we do. Never take that for granted. How do you measure the true worth of a country? It's pretty simple, right? What direction are the people going? Are they leaving or coming? Never forget that and never lose that, what we have. It's truly amazing. Gandhi thought about this a long time. We have to provide animal well-being at a superb level. Uh, the, pres the presenter from JBS told us some scary things, huh? I, that's scary. These people are running around with cell phones that think they know about, more about your business than you do. And they're pretty strong-minded. We've got to make sure that they understand that we provide the five freedoms to these cattle. Simply freedom from thirst and hunger. 
Freedom from environmental challenge. If it storms, we put them behind a windbreak. Freedom from disease, injury. Veterinarians are always working on disease, injury, those kinds of things. Number four is freedom from abnormal behavior. Buller activity in feedlots, tail biting in swine farms, all of those kinds of abnormal behaviors. The biggest problem we have in some feed yards is that cattle refuse to eat. We'll get 18-month-old heifer rats from the Nevada desert, and they'll come to a Kansas feedlot, and they refuse to eat. Now, how do they get to weigh in 1,150 pounds? They ate somewhere. What stopped them from eating? The way the people gathered them, the way they, le they loaded them, the way the sale barn handled them, the way that they were received in the feed yard, and the way they were taken to their home pen is enough to convince some animals to absolutely starve to death and die. How sad. How sad. We can't have that. What Bud taught us in Binkelman was that unless you're good at removing all anxiety, fear, and distress from cattle when they arrive, it's almost impossible to provide the other freedoms. So knowing how to, re to remove all of the anxiety, all the fear, and all the distress makes the other freedoms so much easier to provide. So what we want to do is and re remove our, or remodel our attitude and know what is possible. Reduce our tolerance for weaning panic. Reduce our tolerance for non-eaters. All of these things. Reduce our poor facilities. We've got, we've got some facilities designed in America that are a bigger stress than a truck ride. We need to approach what we've learned about animal instincts and revise how we build things. I think it's really important. The thing that amazes me is that we can have a huge impact on first service conception rates. There's a heifer development yard in Nebraska that has a goal of an 82% first service conception rate on thousands of heifers, and they achieve that. But there were three lots at that, back, or that heifer development yard last winter, or last spring, that achieved an 88 to 92% first service conception rate. Can you believe that? We have, uh, when Dr. Paulo come from Brazil to learn from me, he was in the, the Nalor AI programs in Brazil, and their current first service conception rates were 16%. How in the world? There's no even, not even any reason to try, try AI. And Paulo said, what's wrong? We don't know how to handle semen. No, I said, Paul, I went over and looked, went down to that ranch, and the first, they were just starting to breed and had two cattle on their backs in the alley, and the first one they'd bred, run down there and tried to jump the fence and was hung up by a hind leg. I said, it doesn't matter how you handle the semen if the cattle act like that. Terrorized animals do not conceive. Terrorized animals do not respond to vaccines. So the biggest thing in cow-calf medicine that's been amazing to me is that we can actually change nursing frequency. Enterotoxemia and abomasal ulcers are terrible. And when you can teach a mother to take care of its baby or a baby to take care of its mother and get calves to nurse 25 times a day instead of twice a day, all of a sudden those vaccines start to work. It's just amazing. I had no idea, and what amazes me, when cow-calf people teach their calves to nurse 30 times a day, that's the way those calves eat in the feed yard. They go get tiny little carbohydrate meals many times a day, and they just flourish. The other things that are really amazing is that we have a huge potential in America to create weight gain, weight gain on weaning day. It's, it's just amazing. The thing that is important is you have the best carcass quality breed in the universe. Not in the, not in the nation, in the universe. And we used to worry about aggressive implant programs at the end of the feeding period that we would decrease the amount of choice or upper two-thirds choice. When do we ruin grading in cattle? When they weigh 600 pounds. Here's this big, fast-growing calf on his mama, and we take him away and put him in a pen somewhere, and he stops eating. He gets sick, and he doesn't perform for a month. It changes his slope of intramuscular fat deposition the rest of his life. Those cattle have to continue to perform. They cannot get sick, so it's really important. Those are just examples of things that we, we can achieve. You can see where all of a sudden, when we're working with these animals, the focus becomes the quality of the work, not how fast we can do it. Understanding these animals at a higher degree facilitates that, and most importantly, 
If we don't have support from ownership and management, nothing improves. All of you in here know that everything that's good comes from above. And if that, if that interaction from above is, dis, is dis, disturbed, the people down here doing the work are lost. We have to support things from above. It's, it's so, so important. Merck Animal Health and BCI, Beef Cattle Institute, and the PAC veterinarians have, have worked hard to put some training modules. And this is just an introductory uh, introduction to creating connections. It's almost as old as time itself. It's vital to sustaining life. As a veterinarian, I've come to learn that the proper handling of cattle and how we communicate with them are critical to cattle health. You see, to us, the way we do things matters. It's the how that's important. It's not about vaccinating 100 cows. It's how we do that. So as a cattleman, I believe in continuous improvement. This series is about that journey. Learning from the best cattlemen, joining our efforts to learn, and sharing better ways to raise cattle. It's going to be a remarkable experience, and I would like to share that with you. biggest problem we have with early detection of disease is if animals do not trust us, they are not honest about how they feel. All of these animals understand that we are, if we're a wolf or a predator, we are going to pick on or try to eat the weakest one, the one that limps, the one that's slow, the one that's sick, the one that's old. And so if these cattle perceive us as a threat, they will hide lameness. They will hide early illness. They will hide fatigue as long as we're in here. On the other hand, if they trust us? If they trust us, they will limp if they're sore. They will be depressed if they have pneumonia. It's really important that, that we what we're seeing is an honest picture of their true state of health. That's why you're not using the word fear, right? That's right. Yeah, it's, it's a confusion or distrust. Once you introduce yourself to a pen of, of newly weaned cattle or any, any new cattle that you've never met before, it's important to look over the top of the herd, not, not watching the animals that are right in front of you, but have a wide field of vision. And if you see an animal raise his head like this, you already know that you've been too much of a presence. So it would be really important to bring that animal's head back down and get him to trust you before you went any further. If you think about one word to describe a horse or a few words to describe a horse, what is a horse for you? A very good friend. I've made a living all my life with him. Got a lot of respect for him. This is really positive, Dr. Paulo, that they are volunteering to investigate, investigate. Everything's okay. Really nice set of cattle. Now, and, and the first time we went here this morning, I said, you're gonna see the next time. And now with the third day are ready. You can see, you, you can see how they can change so quickly. Our friend is still worried about us. She's still worried, so we're gonna give her more room. Yeah, she's a hard, hard keeper. There we go. Just work from the front. That away, angels. Two, three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight, nine. Beautiful. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. We got two too many. To bring those two, please.
Bud Williams loading feral cattle on a boat. He would trained them to go through little narrow bridges and he'd, the military backed this boat up, threw down an end gate and he was standing there like these and these cattle would come by and jump in a boat. And I've always thought if he can get cattle, to, feral cattle to load in a boat, surely we can get a few cattle to go in this thing. Right. We, it's another facility. The, the, the people are the key, not, not the steel and concrete. I want to encourage you to contact your Merck rep uh, and ask them for access to this series of training modules. There's basic stockmanship, cow-calf management, feedlot management, heat stress management. There's a, there's a nice bunch of modules. So please, please uh, ask the Merck people to get you to the website, all one word, creatingconnections.info, creatingconnections.info. Please, please share this with your neighbors. What my dream is, is that you can help us change weaning behavior. I hope you can help us, if cattle are being hauled, that the people driving the truck know something about cattle. I hope you can help us understand that when calves go through a sale barn, it doubles their morbidity, mortality, treatment cost, and injuries. We need sale barns but we have to be able to send an animal through a marketing channel without doubling mortality. It's really important. The other thing is prudent antibiotic use. If an animal, uh, if an animal has pneumonia, we need to treat it. But there are a hundred things that'll cause a calf to be uh, depressed. And that's why I want you to listen to the stuff about whisper. Because 10 years ago, any calf in a feedlot that was doing this got a dose of antibiotics. Now, we try to diagnose that. If he, has, if he has a tummy ache, he doesn't need an antibiotic. So please, please understand these things. This is an example of what we used to see as, as weaning. That's, that's why Bud moved to Binkleman. These kids are from Phillipsburg, Montana. They come to Binkleman. They've been doing this already for eight hours. We thought that was normal. Now, Bud taught us how to stop that at arrival. And we don't have time to go into that, but this, this is my wife's kids. They're weaning. This is amazing. The mothers were loaded three hours ago and went to the cornfields, and once in a while one of these little babies will say a little bit, but 99% of these calves are ruminating, gaining the weight on the milk and the grass they ate this morning. That is truly amazing. And when you take the, she direct contracts these calves to a feed yard, she stands at the back of the trailer and leads them to the bunk, and they go to the bunk and eat till they can't hold anymore, go drink till they can't hold any more water, and go find the bedding and go to sleep. That's what you can all do, and it's just amazing, and I want to talk to you about creating that. We changed three things to create that. We changed the way we tagged new babies. We stopped pairing out. And the most important day of training is weaning or branding and pre-weaning vaccination. And out there, I'm still having trouble because branding is the most important day out where I live, and we've ruined a lot of cattle. We'll have four or five very gentle people take care of 200 mamas and babies all through the calving season, and then some Saturday morning, here comes 20 aluminum trailers over the hill and everybody gets out with their horse and ropes these calves and drags them to the fire. And most of the people horseback don't own any cattle. Don't let them do that. I'll tell you how Chris changed this weaning behavior on branding day. It's really important that you know that that's possible. So what we're here to do is to empower caregivers to be dedicated to make every human animal interaction positive and all intervention. Every time we do something, we train the cattle. We have a lot of pasture rotations in Nebraska. I go to these ranches and they go down after lunch and honk the horn at the gate. 250 cows will come running out of the hills and almost tear the gate posts out. Where are their babies? They left their babies. How much pressure and confusion would it take to drive a mother away from something it loves? You see that in Walmart once in a while, but you shouldn't see it on a ranch. It's just amazing. But these are just everyday interventions that can make cattle better. So we do that by learning how to communicate with cattle. We take the voice away, what do we have left? 
how we stand, where we stand, the use of angles and speed and stimulus and reward, request and reward, just like a border collie. And so it's really important that we understand these tools. There's a book written that says the shoulder is the point of balance of cattle. That's kind of an orientation spot, but really the shoulders to keep the front of the animal off the ground. What part of the animal are you working with? The eye. If you are not available to that eye, you're in the wrong place. And if you're at your shoulder, you're pulling her mind around. Please don't work cattle off the shoulder. When I turn a couple of these cattle out here, I want you to remove the fences from your mind. And, and, and this could be a pasture, a feedlot pen, or it could be a hundred in here, not just two. I'm not used to working in some with uh, this, but, but just don't pay attention to the fences. Just imagine that we're 50 cows in a pasture, okay? But this is what we have to, this is, uh, this is the receiver. It's the receiver. What's different about that eye than the eyes in this room? All the eyes in this room are round, like a mountain lion or a, a predator. All the eyes in, in, the, in this pen are out on the side of the head. The, the creator made this animal so that because of this horizontal pupil and the shape or the position of the eye, when they're grazing, they can see 360 degrees around them. Precious. But that takes away depth perception. They don't know how far away you are. So that's why when you're in a group of cattle, you never ever stand like a post. It'll drive them crazy. Always just act like your hip hurts. Just be doing something. Just push on them and but you have to move. You have to move. You have to move. But the number one instinct that they didn't teach me in veterinary school was that cattle crave to see you all the time. They crave to see their source of guidance simultaneously with their destination, and they crave to come half around you. You have to satisfy that. And you satisfy that with correct position. These are, this is an example of incorrect position. This man is a caretaker, not a caregiver. His job oh, is cowboys. to send these feeder cattle out of this pen and go to the left. Make but yeah, he's tearing okay. the hearts out of these cattle. About a third of them are hitting their shoulders, their ribs, their hips on that post. They're all messing up their feet. He's, 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 the, all these cattle are saying either he doesn't care or he doesn't know. Neither of those are very good. It's just so sad. Now, if you see this happening, please, please instruct people why that's so important. Because they, they have to turn loose, and these are hard to sort, hard to load, hard to, hard to process. It's just, it's just absolutely terrifying to these creatures. I tried to, when they were laying some he's, of these trees, I tried to get them front, that whole but he's, he's on the wrong side. There'll be a boy here in a minute that'll, now if you're just counting, it doesn't matter so much. It'd be better if he was on the left eye. How do you slow cattle down if they go too fast? Go with them. How do you speed them up? Go against them. He's slowing them down and he's going against them. This man in the blue shirt understands how to do this correctly. Please, please share this with whoever you have at home, especially at sale barns and dairies and ranches, because it's so, so critical to convincing these cattle that you understand. So here he comes. He never gets behind any cattle. He goes down, he looks over at that other corner, and when the front start, he starts, he stops. And he actually could back up close to the gate. Look at that poetry in motion. All of those animals can see their source of guidance simultaneously with their destination, and they get to come half around it. And you can see here, cattle prefer you on the left side, but this instinct to come half around you is more important to cattle than the subtle difference between right and left eye thrust. Please, please develop this skill. It's, it's just, it's so, so critically important. Uh, so I think one of the things we want to do, um, just as a, just an as example, is this idea that we can train cattle. These things really help us if we start at feedlot arrival and go to harvest. But when you have control of these creatures from conception to harvest, it's magic, absolutely magic. Um, when does a calf get stressed the first time in his life? How early? 
When does a calf get stressed the first time? When you preg check. Here's a, here's a five month old fetus, and if the cows are nervous when you're preg checking, it affects that fetus. The cortisol in the mother goes way up. That'll change that calf's development of his immune system forever. When is the next time he's stressed? Birth is still a miracle. Conception and birth is a miracle. That birth is a big day, big, big day. And we should never, ever interrupt maternal behavior. But these, these things are really important. And what, what Bud taught us was, I'd say, Bud, what is your dream? He said, I'd love to be able to put cattle in this pen in such a way that they would stay in this pen with all the gates open until I came in and removed them. My border collie can do that, why can't I? So we have to create voluntary activity in cattle. Cattle should go somewhere because they want to. And if we can fill the, pe the world with people doing things because they want to, not because they have to, and cattle doing things because they want to, not because they have to, it changes everything. So really, really important. How do you do that? Is you create a culture. We create a culture that allows caregivers to excel, and so we have to provide them with tools, training, and most of all, the freedom. Don't worry about making a mistake. This, so many people go out and try these things, and they'll go, what if I make a mistake? There's, that's okay. How do you get better? If you, don't, if you don't make five or six mistakes a day, you're not going fast enough. You can go too fast, slow down. You can go too far to the front, come back. It's really, really important that we understand these things. Uh, by nature, cattle are followers, so we need to get them to trust us. Uh, this is a group of cattle. I was in, the, in Queensland, and they were going to take these cattle to the Northern Territory, and I said, how do you load them out there? What kind of facilities? He said, we don't have any corrals. We just have to train about 10% of them to want to be in a truck. These cattle come out of this windbreak, so we stopped processing, and they said, we're going to train these strays. They're always the smartest. But watch this kid in the back. He's half border collie. It's just amazing. These cattle go on this truck because they want to. These cattle like to walk straight. They like to follow each other. They like stimulus and reward. And that boy in the back, that's not random. He finds an eye and leaves. Finds an eye and leaves. This was just, this just absolutely amazed me. It was a hot day. We went, uh, we went over under those trees and had a glass of tea and come back in about 15 minutes. Those calves were still in that truck. He had to go up in the truck and unload them. So that's why I tell veterinary students, if you get a call to Bangs vaccinate replacement heifers, it should be illegal to vaccinate a replacement heifer the first time she's in a chute. You should ask the customer, how many times has that little heifer got to go through the facility without a needle? And if he says, no, I never, then you said, please take the time to do that before I get there. It'll change that young female for the rest of her life. And if he says, I don't have time, I gotta plant corn, because we all need more corn, then ask him if you can do that when you get there. It'll literally, we have a backgrounding yard in Washington that receives 800 to 1200 calves every night out of Montana, and that crew has to get them processed the next day and get them out of there for more calves. They still run all those babies through a bud box and a Daniel's Alley before they start processing. Before they started doing that, it'd be 9.30 at night when they got 1,200 processed. Now, they do that 1,200 and they're done at 3.30 cleaning up. Takes, it takes about six minutes to run 80 calves through that facility. And then when you bring them back to process them for real, you just get out of the way because they just try to crawl in the chute. Train, 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 please. This, uh, in, in Australia, in order to get a preconditioning certificate, you have to separate the babies from their mothers for two days and you have to work them. Chris had these, uh, you have to send them through the facility with nothing open. He's, these were working so good, he said, I wonder if they'll go through the chute backwards. So here he brings 84 of these little calves, and he's standing over here in the shadow just doing this, and all those calves went from the front of the chute to the back. When cattle will handle like that, it's just amazing, just amazing. So please have confidence that these things can be done. So I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna turn a couple little heifers out here and, 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 and play with them, 
and, and if you have any questions, I want to I want to follow up with the the discussion on uh, um, on what we uh, how we train these calves to be weaned. Any questions? Thank you very much. You can that goes back here. Can you just hand or just take that and put it on the table there? For, there you go. Okay, so so I'm gonna I'm gonna let these two little cattle out here. Have you noticed anything intriguing about these cattle standing in here? They're in they're in a building probably for the first time of their life with 300 people. What have those heifers been doing that's very positive? Chewing their cud. Can you believe that? When we forgot in the feedlot world that cattle that are confident ruminate with purpose. Um, I, I found an old neurophysiology textbook the other night, and it was talking about all the stress hormones, cortisol, norepinephrine, adrenaline, how devastating that is to the immune system. And then it said there's a way to change those hormones. And there are two cattle behaviors that create a scenario in the brain where the brain pours out opiates and endorphins. And the two behaviors are chewing their cud and showing exuberance when they go by you, playing. So cattle at play, cattle that chew their cud aren't for, full of cortisol. So, okay. Now, this, I don't know, can you see this, these two heifers? Okay, both of those animals are asking me to do what? Both of those are begging me to come here. Anytime you see an animal do that, run to the front. That's hard to turn their neck. And if they crane around there and ask you what you want, go get right in front of them. And they'll get straight and they'll relax. Why did I choose to come over here and introduce myself on the left side of these cattle? They made that choice, not me. Cattle, horses, pigs, sheep, if you give them a chance, they'll always want to meet you with their left eye against you the first time. Why is that? The optic nerve crosses. Whatever goes into the left eye of a cow goes over to the right or the thinking cognitive side of the brain. Whatever goes into the right eye goes over to the more reflexive sensory part of the brain. So it's the first time you meet these animals, the first time you work these animals, it's really important to choose to be on the left eye. If we're going to acclimate these cattle in a feedlot pen, we save mountains of time by creating counterclockwise movement. Why? Because we can use the left eye. Always, always give them a chance. This facility is set up so the people are on the left side of the chute. That's what you'd prefer. That's what you'd prefer. So I'm going to, uh, they, uh, they're ready, I think. So, OK, now I want, I want these heifers to, to come out. And I'd prefer that they came over on this side. So I'm going to open the gate, and I'm going to choose to work them from this side of the fence. And if this pen was bigger, the pasture was bigger, I'd do the same thing. But if I want to get prepare their minds to come this way, this is where I work on this side. OK, they're asking me. I've got to show them where I want them to go. Then I'll just come by their eye. Not the shoulder, the eye. And then it's really important that I take the first one. In a processing barn, we don't take five. We take one or two to get 10. And then if we want the other one, we just back by her. And she'll follow her friend. The gears and cattle are simple. If I want to stop this animal, I'll go parallel. Wow. And she'll say, are you sure? And then I just straighten out her eye, OK? If I want her to go and not stop, then this is the gear. This is called continue. As she goes, I don't go parallel. I give her more room. That's continue, OK? OK, when she stops, I've got to stop. Reward the stop. Stop the trot. Never, never, when they stop, never push them. The first time she stops, always count to seven, one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then she's ready to take guidance again. And I can just push on this right eye and say thank you. 
Okay, here she comes around to the left again. Um, I want to illustrate um, acclimating feedlot cattle before I put them through the facility. But if I want these cattle to come over here, I work here. This, I position myself in front of the cattle. I want them to see me, their destination, and I want them to be able to come half around, half around. Then I just step back, and if I want to move this one forward, and she says, oh, come on. She keeps wanting me to come here, and then I can go by her eye. It's really, really important. Same situation here. I'd like for these to come down the fence, and I want them to be as close to the fence as possible, and I'm gonna have to tell them, no, we're not gonna come half around this time. So we just bump that eye, bump this eye, and then, This is a really great opportunity because uh, you can see here, where was their favorite corner? Right there. They, they just instinctively went there. Do you know why? I don't. I don't have any idea why. But the point is that's where they went. If we had a feedlot and the bunk and the tank was down there and all the cattle stayed there, our performance would be limited. So it's my job to make these cattle just as content down there as they are there. That's called acclimation. So the way we do that is the first time they went right there to those steps and then, and then they wanted to come back. So I just let them go back, let her go back where she likes. Okay, now let's see how far they go this time. They're, these cattle are really, really courageous because most cattle, if you, had, if you had 300 human eyes pushing on these cattle, they wouldn't go any place. Someone, someone has absolutely got these cattle just really, really trusting, really trusting. We're not talking about making gentle cattle. Please don't take the movement out of your cattle. These cattle that won't move, like a Holstein, they really, really are hard to work with. And so please, please, never t reward the stop. Now she won't stay, why? Because her feet are like this. You can't, you can't set the parking brake with her feet like that. So I've got to ask her to step that foot back. So she's balanced and comfortable. No, that's still not very good. There, good, good girl. Okay. No, you go up with your sister. We used to use hot shots in the processing barn, and now we don't have any hot shots. We've taken them all away. What'd she do when she stopped? She licked her nose. What does a colt do when, she start, when he starts to trust you? He licks and chews, right? So now in our processing barns, we count how many cattle are licking and chewing to, so they'll look nice in the... In the uh, um. Now, if you're working with a single animal, just push until you get, that's hello, that's one. You'll have to get closer to say hello twice. Make her move a foot, that's twice. Okay, and then give her a minute to think about and then she'll take pressure a lot easier. And you can just keep, you can just keep doing. And this is what, uh, and, and uh, the, being able to, now you could say I'm at the shoulder but I, I'm, I'm, I don't usually point, but I'm, I'm pointing where I'm looking. I'm pointing where I'm pressuring, okay? Now, if this is where the feed bunk is and a new set of cattle go there, then you go away and make it very, very clear to her that when she goes up there, you're gonna take all your pressure and presence away. 
That's, that's called acclimation. That's how we place past, uh, cattle in a pasture where they won't go. That's how we place cattle next to a feed mill or a, or a processing barn. So that's really, really important. Now let's see if her sister got enough courage to go with her. Okay, now I'm gonna push on this hip and see if I can bring this left eye around. And I'm gonna push on this. Okay, good job. You have to let, her mind has to go before her body. There's no use pushing on one if their mind is stopped. It's really, really important, really important. But just be, being able to take animals to some place where they were a little bit hesitant is really, really positive, really, really positive. Okay, as part of the training, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask these cattle to go, let's see, we got the, the chute open. We're just gonna take them down through this prefert system. This is beautiful. This, this fence is open. The cattle can see me. Uh, this, this chute is open. Uh, the cattle can take guidance from me. That's, that's really a really nice facility. And it's set up so that I can work on the left side. So if I was, if we had a lot of cattle to work, we would ask these cattle to go in this tub on this side, then the people on the other side of the facility would be the, the people responsible. Oh, you go. Okay, this gate, I, I wouldn't use it to crowd cattle. Uh, we, on a tub, we, we try to shut the gate and then just go to the hinge. Don't push them with the gate. Just go. If they stop, you can just take your hand and go front to back. Don't thump on them. They are very direction sensitive. So if I do that, they'll go. That's the way their mother directed them under their udder that first time. That's, that's forward. If you want them to back up, do this. Oh, she's proud of herself. Now we'll take, we'll take two. But these, um, these animals are, are uh, so, so remarkable in that I think they will forget no, they never forget, but they forgive. I've got a, my cattle partner that buys cattle for me. After he processes new calves in a couple days, he'll go down and send them through the facility to show them that every time they go through there, they don't get branded and tagged and implanted. And they just, the second time, they just go through. How, how much of a blessing is that? That these creatures know that we've got to do some of these things, and the younger we do these things, the better off we are. So I, uh, let, me, let me see if I can, but what I wanna encourage you is, as you have young babies, the way, we, the way we trained those black calves to wean like that, on branding day, we didn't, it wasn't Saturdays the day we branded, Wednesday we gathered the pairs about evening, we had two pins, A and B, moved them back and forth, separated the calves, and we put 130 calves in an alley in a system like this, and we put all the cows out in front and went to supper sometime in the middle of the night. All those calves went through that facility and were out nursing. That's what changed those calves. And when we got to Saturday, it was just poetry in motion. And the kids bringing the calves to the cradle, the rule was you can't push on a calf if he stops. You've got to do that. And he'll go. So, and then we did the same thing at pre-weaning. Only the calves knew the, the routine. We had a chute instead of a calf cradle. Instead of letting the calves go, we had a panel out here and we asked the babies to stay overnight like those Australian calves, away from their mothers and scattered hay and water over here one night, turned them out. That's the only two things that changed those black calves from acting like the Charlet Cross. So about, how's our time? A couple? Okay, all right, any questions? I wanna, um, 
I want to encourage you, if you have questions, you can uh, get my contacts from the American Angus Association or, or please, please pursue that Creating Connections website uh, on, uh, 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 from, the, from the Merck Rep. We'll just put these two girls through here. This is kind of intense. Uh, don't, don't be a nuisance. You notice that I asked these cattle to do something and then I went away. They, it's like training a young horse. Don't, don't just keep after them. They've, they've got an attention span longer than a goldfish, but don't just keep harassing them. Oops, girl, sorry. Come on, let's go. That's fine, that's fine. She's asking me to come here and buy her eye. It's my responsibility to be where, where I can give her guidance. Okay, when they're in that corner, then I would come out here at a 45 degree angle. She's asking me where, and you just come by. Ah, girl. Okay, so if you, if you have a place where they don't want to go, don't pressure them at the gate. Don't, when they go down to that gate, don't pressure them. If you want to get nasty with them, get away from the gate and be nasty here. So you can, you can put pressure on them here, make them feel uncomfortable, make them feel uncomfortable. Wake up. Thank you. Okay, time out, we, are there time up? Yeah, I don't want to take anyone else's time, so. Yeah, yeah, any, uh, if you have somebody wants to come in there and help me, you can, but uh, they'll, they'll go, it's, uh, they've been in, it's been two hours, they're, they're tired. I could take their sisters and go in, but yeah, it's, uh, any, any questions or comments? I, I really want to, I repeat my gratitude for Prefert and, and Merck Animal Health and the American Angus Association. Your, your, cattle, your cattle are helping harness the unknown potential of genetic selection. We, this, uh, one of the, all of these things that I always did in practice was to help us get, help you help us get the value you deserve. It breaks my heart when some of those pins of fat cattle in Amarillo bring as much as those do in Iowa. And that ain't fair. So 
when it comes to accountability and, and keeping track and, 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 and identifying quality, please, please work together as a crew to make sure people know what cattle are, where they've been, and what to expect from them. It it's just makes sense. Thank you very much, Alex. Yes, sir. Thank you. Let's give Dr. Knopfsinger a big round of applause.